So my name is Jerry McCarthy. I'm a volunteer at the uh, National Museum of Computing on Bletchley Park in the UK. And I'm also a, a, a volunteer at the uh, Institut Josefa Pilsudskiego for Londinier, the Joseph Pilsulski Institute in Hammersmith, London. So the device I'm going to talk about is the Cyclometer Polski, or also known as the Cyclometer Mariana Hryevskiego, after the, pro the person who was probably its inventor or had a large hand in designing it. And he's certainly the person who wrote the most about it in his memoirs, uh, post-war memoirs, Marian Ryevsky. <clears throat> now we start with receiving a lot of Enigma messages on a given day. And those of you who can read Polish, and I think there's at least probably two of you here going by the uh, names in the list. Uh, let's assume that on a given day, we receive the following messages. Well, it's actually the following messages, message headers. And using these message headers, we can do some mathematics to produce a, a table of codes or a table of information like this. And I'm going to go into what all this means in due course. Mary Andrievsky and his colleagues created this machine, the cyclometer. I'm showing you this picture with the kind permission of a colleague of mine, Marek Grajek, who's based in Poland. And he's the author of uh, a number of books about uh, the, um, the breaking of Enigma by Polish mathematicians and engineers. I have created a version of my own of the same machine. It's not as beautiful as the uh, nice engineering drawing here, but it does work in its way. Before we go get too deep into that machine though, I, I need to explain a bit about how Enigma works. And those of you who've attended uh, my previous talks on various Enigma breaking methodologies have seen this bit. So uh, I won't be offended if you uh, pop off for five minutes just to skip the next, well, maybe five minutes or 10 minutes. And the first question you need to ask is what is an Enigma machine? It was a German encryption machine. And there were this many machines, each gray or yellow circle represents a version of the famous Enigma machine. And I'm showing you this table. I'm required to uh, tell you this contractually. Uh, it's copyright Paul Rovers and Frode Weyerud of the Netherlands and Norway, respectively. So here's an example of an Enigma machine. It's not one you see very often. It's very unusual. I don't know if any still exists. It's notable for having a printer. This is an enigma which only does numbers. So you can encrypt any message as long as it only has the digits one to zero, one to nine and zero in it. This is a machine which you're more likely to be familiar with. The National Museum of Computing has one of these on display, um, for, um, actually available for uh, visitors to uh, operate. This is a four rotor Enigma, which is used primarily by the German Navy. This is um, a very special Enigma of which only two are known to exist. This one is an Enigma of the machine that was designed by Polish mathematicians and engineers and is in the Institute Józefa Piłsudskiego in Hammersmith in London. It's somewhat unusual compared with all other enigmas. For example, it's got an, a keyboard, which instead of conforming to the German Quertzu keyboard, has a keyboard that runs from A alphabetically through to Z at the bottom right. I'm gonna concentrate on this yellow range, which is a range of small range of four machines. And this is an example of one such. Now, what does an enigma do? It encrypts, obviously, it changes letters, it replaces letters that you type in into other letters. Now, just to take a simple introduction, let's have a look at a, a, um, a trivial ciphering algorithm called the Caesar cipher. So-called because it is 
said that Julius Caesar himself used it. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but uh, that's the story. Julius Caesar's personal cipher. You have a very important message which must be kept secret. And you just take all the letters of the alphabet having assigned the value one to the letter A, uh, the number two to the letter B, all the way up to the number 26 to the letter Z. And you add five to each of the letters in the message you want to encrypt or any other number. So A becomes F, B becomes G, C becomes H and so on. This allows you then to end up with a text that looks like this. <clears throat> And anybody who was reasonably smart could work out that given the word divisions are there, and if you know the uh, language is English, you could actually work it backwards fairly quickly to the original, uh, the original unencrypted message. So you would normally take such a text as this and break it up into five letter groups. And although I haven't shown it here, you'd pack the last five letter group with three random letters, just so that it's not obvious that the message ends here rather than three letters on. When you want to decrypt it, if you know it's a Caesar cipher, then you can just start working your way, brute forcing your way through the keys. So you could say, is the key one? Subtract one from every uh, letter in the encrypted message. So F becomes E and Z, uh, A becomes Z and so on. And that's obviously not an English text. You can try two and you still end up with a bad result. Eventually, and I won't waste your time with three and four, you go to five and you end up with the original text, albeit with the word divisions missing. Now, another way of encrypting this, uh, decrypting this message is just to count the letters. And the letter J is very, very common in this message. And the letter Y is the second most common letter in this message. Now, it is known, given this message is in English, it is known that the English letter frequency has E at the top as the most frequent letter, T as the second most frequent, I as the third most frequent, and so on. So you can already see, you can already guess that J is going to represent E and Y is going to represent T. So therefore, J equals E and Y equals T, as I just said. And of course, J minus E or Y minus T are both equal to five. So you have indeed found the original, the original key, the original number. Now you can make this more complicated by instead of only adding five, you add five to the first character, six to the second character, seven to the third character, and so on. Um, and if you try and count the letters in this, then you notice now that the, the, um, the pattern is very much less obvious. The uh, fre letter frequency pattern is very much less obvious. Now, the Enigma takes this, takes this uh, trivial encryption to an even greater depth. On the machine, you have three wheels, three rotors as they're called, and underneath the panel, a component called the reflector. You also have a light panel. Uh, underneath each of these letters is a lamp, which is illuminated when an appropriate key is pressed. And you have keyboard, which is obviously a keyboard. And you have a plug board on the front. Every time you press one of these keys, one of these lights will come on. And it's a, a rule that falls out of the design of Enigma that no letter can encrypt to itself. In the top of the back, you have this um, instruction sheet. I just have to press a button over here, excuse me. You have an instruction sheet, which if you can read uh, German, uh, is actually just cleaning instructions and contains almost nothing of any um, cryptological significance. Now here's an example of uh, a simulator for Enigma. And in this case, I'm going to demonstrate how A gets encrypted to H.
Now, the first thing that happens when I press the A key is that the rotors turn. So this, the rotors turn before anything else happens once I've pressed the key. The rightmost rotor always steps once. The middle rotor steps once every time this right rotor has stepped 26 times. And the leftmost rotor steps once every time the middle rotor has stepped 26 times. So you end up with 17,576 positions of these three rotors. That's a slight simplification because in fact, there's a quirk in the hardware, which means that you get, you get some 600 less than that, but uh, that's not important right now. So current now starts to flow through the keyboard. It goes through the A key and it appears on the plug board at the point A. Now A, as it happens, has been on this occasion plugged into the letter M. So A has already been encrypted to M. Current flows into the drum on the right, which is underneath the cover on the right. You can't actually see it unless you raise the lid. And it goes through the, the first rotor, the second rotor, the third rotor into the reflector. The, the current then passes through the reflector and back through all the rotors. And it's the presence of this reflector, which in fact enforces the design uh, condition that no letter can encrypt to itself. Goes back through the entry drum as an O. So we had A being encrypted to M here. M has now been encrypted to O here. O is connected on the plug ball to the letter H. and the current circuit is complete and the H lights up. Because the rotors will turn the next time I press the A key, then you will likely be likely to get a different letter. Uh, it's not impossible to get an H the second time, but it's most likely to be one of the other 24 letters of the alphabet. It can't be an A, it's unlikely to be an H. Now this is a, I'll just show you slightly more detail on this simulator. I have encrypted starting at the rotor positions have been placed at A and A and A. And if I encrypt the text AAAA, it is encrypted as GDPB. After I've encrypted AAAA to GDPB, the wheels have now stepped to AAAE. Each, each rotor has what's called a ring. And effectively, each rotor is in two parts. So you have the wiring matrix in one part of the rotor, and you have this ring with the 26 letters of the alphabet. There's 26 wires in here, by the way, and 26 connections on here. So this is actually separate from this and can be rotated relevant, uh, uh, relative to this. Um, it happens that the ring settings are subtractive relative to the rotor positions, by which I mean if you have a rotor position of B and a ring setting of B, then that's equivalent to a rotor position of A with a ring setting of A, etc. C for C, D for D, and so on. And the significant effect of this is, has to do with the turnovers. If I encrypt at uh, the, the wheels set at JFK and the ring set at EWR, then I get this text here, SRAE, PXD, and so on. And then if I reset the wheels to JFK, I get the same, I get the original text back. But if I step JFK, the wheels to JFL, and instead of EWR, the, the rings to EWS, I get it effectively the same text up to here, and then one letter is wrong. If I step this another, these both another step, then you end up with two uh, incorrect characters, three, three incorrect characters. So it's important that you need, you need to be able to determine what the key settings and the ring settings were when you are eavesdropping on these German messages and trying to understand the original underlying plain text message.
the wheels themselves, they're depending on exactly which era you look at, here at point in time, there are between three and eight wheels available. In this case, I have rotor one in the leftmost position, two in the middle position, three in the rightmost position. They are always um, denominated using Roman uh, characters, Roman unions. So they go all the way up to eight on the later uh, versions of Enigma. The reflector is also variable and the various reflectors were A and B and C. Now, if I set the wheels back to AA and A and type in GDPB, which is the text I typed in originally, then I get the original plain text of AA, AA. And this is because the Enigma machine is fully reversible. So you don't, unlike on some machines, on this machine, you do not have any requirement to have a encrypt, decrypt switch. This is because once again, the effect of the reflector. So you've, um, you've made it a bit easier for the operators because they are not going to accidentally encrypt a message in a decrypt setting or vice versa, because there is only the one setting. The settings for a given day are determined by a coding sheet, which are issued by month. And here you have an example of a coding sheet, which um, obviously I've faked up. Today is the 13th of June. So we have the reflector known as the Umkehrwalze, which is B. The three rotors are Roman five, three and two. The ring settings on those uh, three rotors are positions two, 24, and three. And the plug board has A plugged into M, B plugged into O, D plugged into T, and so on. And note that A being plugged to M also implies the reverse. So M is plugged into A. This rightmost column is not particularly cryptologically significant. The Ken grouper would be sent as a plain text, part of a plain text header before the message. So that if somebody is working on the uh, GZE network and a message, they happen to hear a message that's aim, uh, aimed for the FZY network, then they do not, then they know they don't have to bother taking it down and decrypting it and so on. They know to only listen for messages addressed to them specifically. This is a view of the plug board on the front. If the, uh, in, this ex, in this example, I have actually got B plugged into G and P plugged into Z. If I didn't have these plugged in, then AAAA instead of going to GDPB would go to BDZG. So it has quite a dramatic effect on the encryption process. Now, there are two ways of decrypting messages from Enigma and indeed from most uh, encryption, in, uh, encryption systems. There's a known plain text attack in which you know or are prepared to take on guessing, take a chance on guessing part of the original message. And a ciphertext attack in which you have no idea as to the, any part of the original message. So I'm just going to briefly cover the known plain text attack, which says you have a message up here and you think it's got the text nothing special to report in it so given the rule that no letter can encrypt to itself you can take nothing special to report on a piece of paper or a slide on a slide of a slide rule for example and the encrypted text and slide it along and you can immediately dismiss certain positions of this plain text because at some point for example here the O is underneath this O, and this T is underneath this T. You can then take a, take a setting. Um, you can then take a message. If you know, for example, it's coming from a weather ship. It's a stationary transmitter in the middle of the Atlantic. It's been there for, this, for the day, for day after day after day. And it sends a message at the same time every day. You can be pretty certain it's a, it's a weather ship transmitting a weather forecast, Veta for Hesaga auf Deutsch. And if the encrypted message that we're getting was SNMKGGSTZ, etc., 
then you know that's you can you can treat this as a possible position. You can then draw this picture, which I always think of as looking rather like a, a molecular chemistry uh, diagram, linking the various uh, letters. So for example, we, we have L going to G. So we have L going to G in here. We have N going to E. We have N going to E here. You can go up or down when you're, when you're drawing these lines. You can then use a machine like this. This is a Turing Welshman bomber. This is not a real Turing Welshman bomber. Uh, it's just a um, prop from a film. This is a simulator that I use for um, uh, decrypting uh, messages from time to time. And you can plug in this text, this, this map into these, into the plug board at the back and then run it to determine the settings of the message or some of the settings of the message. There's a four rotor version of this machine, uh, was primary, which was generated, created by American uh, engineers for the German naval enigma, the four rotor enigma. But that's enough about that particular thread of decryption. Uh, that's a whole other lecture. So now we're going to go to the ciphertext attack in which you have no idea as to any part of the original message. So let's say we have a key for the day that's somehow been sent to you, N-O-R. And you're going to send, you're going to develop, you're going to create a message key for a given message, C-A-R. I just picked three relatively random letters for these two. Now, the, the point is the key for the day remains the same for all messages you are going to send for a given day. The key for the message should be different for every message you're going to send. So you take CAR and CAR and you encrypt it twice using the setting NOR. And then you set the machine to NOR. I'm sorry, to, you take the machine off the NOR setting and put it on the CAR setting and then encrypt the rest of the message. So the quick brown fox, for example, starts off with AVQMVDEO. And you send, before you send the encrypted message, you send this message header, which contains this uh, encrypted version of the message key, which has been encrypted using the daily key. So the first six letters will be the encrypted message key, and then following text is the message itself. And this will be preceded, as I mentioned earlier, by the uh, Ken grouper, the recognition uh, characters. Now there's a, an interesting phenomenon in uh, Enigma-related statistics known as the Samitsa, which is, roughly translated as females for reasons which are somewhat lost in history. Um, you can also use the Polish term oculare, which, and it means spectacles or eyeglasses. Now, if you happen to encrypt C-A-R, C-A-R at today's, uh, today's daily setting, and you end up with A-B-C-A-D-E, you have what is known as a 1,4. <clears throat> excuse me, Samitsa. If you happen to have two Bs in the, in the second and fifth positions, then you have a two five. And if you happen to have two Cs in the third position, then you have a three six. So if you have similar letters in uh, three apart, so you've got one, two, three, and then one, you've got similar letters, the same letters, which are position three positions apart. Now, another methodology was created early during the war was the Puakta Zygalski Jäger, invented by one Henrik Zygalski, which takes advantage of these uh, females to determine, uh, to help to determine the ring settings that were being used. Uh, Marian Ryevsky says that if you, move, you, if you have enough of these sheets and you have to put in one sheet per message and you move them correctly, then then uh, eventually all the lights that you're shining through the sheets, the stack of sheets go out until you have only one. Um, 
the, um, the specification is a little bit hazy because it probably corresponds to the right case, that is to the solution. Now I actually tried this myself. I created a generated a number of Sikalski sheets and tried stacking them. And as you can see, I was not having a happy time of it. So I decided it was easier just to write some software to do it. And this effectively uh, has uh, shows uh, uh, eight Sigalski sheets stacked on each other and the light is only shining through one hole and you can do a bit of uh, mathematics to determine that the ring settings I was using was in fact the letters J and X. Another device that was created was the Bomba Mariana Riaschiego. Uh, once again, I am my thanks to Marek Grojek for allowing me to show this picture. This was a device which was effectively an advanced version of the Sigalski sheets. And I happen to have one of those here, but that's the subject of a whole other lecture. There was a, another method called the Metoda Zegara Jezego Ruzitski Jego, or Jezi Ruzitski's clock method. And this was, uh, if you have two messages that you can uh, line up one underneath the other, and if you know where one of them was, what the real, what the settings were for one of them, then you might be able to determine what the settings are for another one. If the second message started with the key which was close to the first message, this was reinvented uh, by the British code breakers at Bletchley Park, where it's called Banborismus named after the sheets that they used to uh, maintain this, to uh, do the work, which were punched and printed in Banbury in Oxfordshire. Now let's move on to the cyclometer, which is why you're all here. This is a picture of Marie Andrievsky, who may or may not have been the inventor of the device, but he's certainly the person who wrote the most about it. Uh, he's standing in front of the Colossus rebuild in uh, Bletchley Park or in the National Museum of Computing, which is slightly unfortunate because he would not have had anything to do with uh, with Colossus. And it states here that he was a Polish mathematician and cryptologist. And in nine, the year 1932, he broke the German machine cipher Enigma along with his colleagues Henryk Zygalski and Jerzy Ruzicki. A lot of this work was done in the city of Poznan, which is roughly halfway between Berlin and Warsaw on a train line. Uh, outside the uh, Poznanski Zamek, uh, Poznan Castle, which is now part of the university, there is this memorial to Marian Rurevsky, Jerzy Ruzicki, and Henryk Zygalski. Something that puzzles uh, people who are of that uh, frame of mind is, uh, is what all these numbers mean. And the only thing we know is that uh, this are the, is the birth dates of the three gentlemen in question. So this one is 15th July, 1908. And these are the dates that they passed away, 30th August, 1978. Henrik Zygalski, uh, as it happened, stayed in England after the war and his and there's a memorial to him in uh, Chichester Crematorium, should anybody want to go see it. This is, although this is a picture of me on vacation, uh, it's not really intended for you to see me, but behind here, there's going to be an Enigma breaking uh, center. Uh, I've been told you can't call it a museum. It's a Enigma breaking center where all of the Enigma breaking uh, methodologies will be described in detail. Now the next four slides come from a very handy uh, document, Vespomnienia za mej pracy w obierze szyfrów, and so on, uh, which is available from a website spybooks.pl. Um, I don't quite know why spybooks.pl being a Polish website can't actually manage to put the Polish accented letters in because there should here, for example, be uh, between the R and the W, there should be an O with an accent, Schiffroof, but still. 
uh, as written here, as, as written on its front page. Now, this is the original text that I showed you. So these are the headers of the six bit headers of a considerable number of messages. We have something like 45 messages here, a day's worth of uh, received messages. Now this, uh, this document is kind of interesting because it's been typed on a typewriter, but the accented characters have mostly been added by hand. Polish uh, has uh, nine special characters, which I, which I set out before you, and none of these characters are available on either an English typewriter or a French typewriter, and it, that text I'm showing you was almost certainly written on either an, uh, an English or a French typewriter. So somebody has typed all these memoirs by hand on a typewriter and had to go back and add all the accents later on, or possibly even as they were typing. Now, let's have a quick look at this message header these message headers. You can see here that we have the letter A as the first character of the first uh, set of three characters and also the second three characters. So we have we can say that there is a cycle that is two letters long comprising A and A. Now in this example you have B, which goes to C. So the plain text um, message key when encrypted twice, first encryption, the first letter was encrypted to B, and on the second encryption, the first letter was encrypted to C. And here we have the converse. So we have what is effectively a cycle. B becomes C and C becomes B. You can work your way through the entire alphabet looking for these loops. So D becomes V and V becomes P and P becomes F and so on through the alphabet. And eventually you'll end up with D. And this is uh, diagrammatically uh, written like this. You have two you have two cycles of th um, 13 characters, if I recall correctly, and one of which goes D, V, P, F, K, X, G, Z, Y, O, and then it goes back to D. And the second one goes E, I, J, M, U, N, Q, L, H, T. There are two other cycles, B, and go B goes to C and C goes to B, which I showed you on the previous page. And also A goes to A, and as it happens, S goes to S. So if we look at S down here, you'll see there's SJM, SPO, SUG, SMF. You can also do this trick with the second letters. And this is a bit more tedious because of course they're not uh, set up in order that conveniently for analyzing the second letters, but you can start with saying U goes to M and uh, if you can find the M in the middle of one of these columns, and I've lost it for now, but it's not that important really. Oh, I did find it. Okay, well, we won't, we won't belabor this point. So you can now say you have a second set of cycles. B goes to L, goes to F, goes to M, which goes back to B in the second characters of those two, three letter headers. And you have a cycle here, one, two, three, four, nine, two nines, two threes, and two ones. And you can do the same trick with the third letters of those two groups, ending up with this set of characters here which has two cycles of 13 each. Now they then developed this machine, which is called the cyclometer. The basic design is you have two Enigma machines in one box. They're not total, they're not complete Enigmas because there's no plug boards, but you have 
three sets of rotors representing one Enigma machine and three sets of rotors representing the second Enigma machine. And you also have reflectors at the end and entry drums at the other ends. And instead of having a keyboard, you have uh, toggle switches and you have a lamp board just behind. And I'll come into this interesting device in a little while. Now, you could actually work your way around working out what all the cyclic uh, patterns were using two Enigma machines sitting next to each other. So here, for example, I've set an Enigma simulator such that the uh, ring set, the uh, rotor positions are J, X, and G. If I type A, I get Z. And then if I switch to an uh, another machine which is set three letters on so instead of jxg it's now eight g h i j i type z and i get f so a went to z, uh, excuse me a went to z on the second machine z goes to f on the first machine f goes to k and you can work your way through the entire alphabet bouncing between the two machines stepping as you go until you have the full pattern for all of the 26 keys. And then you document that at position JXG and position JXJ, you have three uh, double cycles, one of which is two, a pair of twos, one of which is a pair of sevens, one of which is a pair of fours. You then step you then you can then move on through the alphabet and here's another example ewr on the first enigma machine ewu on the second enigma machine and you can bounce backwards and forwards through the alphabet so a goes to i i goes to z z goes to l l goes to w and so on now they did do this for a while and they decided this was way too much hard work especially as you've got to have two people involved or one person going back and forth between two machines. It was easier to build everything into the one machine, the diagram, the modern reconstruction of which I showed you earlier. And this is a third example. This is a, a diagram of how the machine was originally designed. Uh, those of you who can read Polish can will know what all that says, but actually it's not saying anything that interesting really because it's saying on this side, we have the cover closed. Um, this side, we have the cover open. We have switches, uh, lamps, and we have this, oh, we have the, let, the, alf, the letters of the alphabet. And note once again, like that Enigma machine I showed you, which is in the uh, Institute Josefa Piłsudskiego, they're using once again, a keyboard which runs from A to Z, not in any particular um, typewriter order. And there's this rheostat, which I'll come to in a little while. Now there's the second diagram which explains what's going on. And I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because it's basically just a diagrammatic representation of the software I was running earlier. And I thought that this looks kind of interesting. Maybe I should try building one. So I started by effectively making my own diagram of how this machine worked. And I decided not to do, not to go for the full 26 character system to start with, but just to go for uh, um, some eight characters to work with to start with. And I actually started to build this using uh, bits of wood and plugs and so on. And I ended up in the end with a design that looked like this. And here I will explain the rheostat. When you switch, uh, when you operate one switch, you can have any name, any even number of lights coming on between two of them and 26 of them. And these are coming on in serial. And that means for uh, you, if there are four volt bulbs, for example, and you've got 26 bulbs, all of which may come on in together, 
you need roughly 100 volts to light them, to illuminate them. But if you're at a setting where only two of the bulbs would light, then you're going to be putting 50 volts across two four volt bulbs, and that way you're going to run out of bulbs fairly quickly. So they have this rheostat, which before every switch is operated, has to be set down to zero. Then you operate your switch, and then you crank this up very slowly and very gently until the lights that come on, you can, you can see the lights that come on. And you note down how many lights have come on. You, you wrap this back down to zero and you press another switch. You, lock, you switch another switch until you've gone through all the 26 letters. I didn't want to have a rheostat because um, it could still all go terribly wrong. So I just decided to use a current current limited power supply to have the same effect. And that is my first attempt at a cyclometer. It doesn't look much like the original. It's a reduced version, but it, it does behave as one. And then uh, a slight enhancement was to put, some, put the switches and lights in a box for demonstration purposes. But then I decided it would be rather fun to try and make a real one using real Enigma rotors and, uh, and so on. And I uh, talked to some people about how much it would cost me to make such a machine, specifically to get the reflectors, the rotors, and the entry drum. So there's two of these, six of these, six rotors, and two of these entry drums. And it was uh, it was uh, it was ten thousand dollars or the equivalent in whatever currency you want to put it in, and that was uh, three or four years ago now. So probably even more. So instead, I decided to go for a software solution, and I'm using I'm using a laptop with a display to uh, to act as a guide to effectively demonstrate the positions of the. Uh, the wheels, 26 LEDs and 26 switches and some control buttons to step the rotors. Now the software uh, effectively is two Enigma machines software uh, instantiations in one software lump. So instead of having two Enigmas, I now have one system running two Enigma systems. And as you can see, I'm pressed to the letter, I've, I've here pressed the letter A in fact, and the letters F and H and T and U and Z have come on. And then I can type a, press another key, which operates, uh, I would press the B and then the C, the D, the E, the G and the I come on. And I can work my way through each key position until I end up with all 26 lights having been on. And then I can just write down, yes, okay, at this position, AAA up for the leftmost three wheels and AAD for the rightmost three wheels and where the wheels were one, two, and three, I have these uh, cyclic properties, two ones, two threes, two nines. And this means I can produce an entire catalog of all the possible uh, cyclic uh, cyclic settings, the cyclic results for each of the positions, AAA, AAD, AAB, AAE, AAC, AAF, and so on. And this is an advantage of writing software, of course, because I can just leave it running overnight and in the morning it's come up with a, a text file of some, some gigabytes um, of, of data telling me what all of the cyclic uh, settings were. It happens that my cyclometer is an improvement on the original the original would only have used rotors one, two, and three in all three, in all, in all possible positions or six positions. So it would run from one, two, three to three, two, one. I'm managing, my, my system actually uses all eight rotors of which any three are selectable. So the, uh, the catalog is way, way larger than uh, the real one. Now, to give you an eye, the just uh, give you an idea of the distribution. Um, the case where the you can see 
quite clearly that there's a lot where there's pairs of 13s and there's quite a lot where there are pairs of, of ones. And you can, I can do all this uh, arithmetic and say that where there are two cycles of length 13, there are 1,452,605 uh, possible message settings. Uh, which is which is still a lot, but at least it's cut down the number of possible message settings that you've got to work your way through. And bearing in mind, this is for eight rotors rather than just the plane three. Now the phase four was to actually build some hardware to mimic the behavior of the machine. And this just shows uh, the device that I constructed, the lights, the switches which you can't really see because they're kind of drowned out by the lights and a display which tells me the uh, the uh, wheel settings and that's the front panel in slightly better lit and there are six buttons here for stepping the rotors so i can step the rotors through one to eight leftmost rotor middle rotor rightmost rotor and i can i can step each of those rotors through one of 26 positions so I'm just going to stop the share and share a video, a short video of the machine running. And back to the presentation. So you now have a machine, I now have a machine and the Poles now had a machine to produce a catalog. And this is basically what I was doing in that demonstration. So I would say wheels one, two, three, using AAA for the leftmost three wheels and AAD for the rightmost three wheels and I'm going to start by pressing the letter A. So A is now pressed. And I've just represented that by this underlining. And as a result of A having been pressed, the lights A, F and H, T, U and Z have been illuminated. So I can now say, okay, at this position, one, two, three, A, 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 D. I have two cycles of three. Now, I happen to have this handy guide on the display, which tells me what the next letter is to press, but the, um, the real machine doesn't have that and you have to memorize that for yourself. So now I'm gonna press the letter B and quite a lot of lights come on this time. In fact, 18 lights come on, including the B. And that tells me there's two cycles of nine. And I now, the next letter that hasn't been pressed or illuminated is the Q. So I press the Q and just two come on. So that's two cycles of one. I now step from AAA to AAB and AAD to AAE and I start the process again, generating and noting and writing down the, uh, the catalog as I go until you end up with a catalog a bit like this. And that means you can now take this day's worth of messages and you can just uh, say, okay, what do we have here? We have A going to A, so we've got a one cycle. We've got B going to C and C going to B, so we've got a two cycle. Then you can search through the catalog to see what the settings could have been for this batch of messages. Now, uh, Marian Ryevsky's document has these uh, particular in this particular example, he shows these cyclic patterns for the first 
letters, the second letters and the third letters. And I just thought it would be interesting to see if it exists anywhere within the uh, within the uh, catalog that I've created. Um, so representing it in a slightly easier to understand form, two, um, two cycles of one, two cycles of two, two cycles of 10. And then the next row is two cycles of one, two cycles of three, two cycles of nine, and the third row is two cycles of 13. And I worked out that in my, in my uh, catalog that you've got uh, for eight rotors, this appears 1,791 times. Uh, given that they would only be using three rotors, in fact, that's only 32 times. So there's, you have reduced the number of possible wheel positions and settings to only 32, which is a pretty good result just by, by uh, tracking these messages and looking up those cyclic properties in the catalog, which you produced earlier. And the thing about the catalog is you only have to make it once, although it's a lot of work to make it, it's then remains the same uh, unless and until more wheels are added or rotors are changed or the reflectors are changed. Now, where are the cyclometers today? Uh, the poles produced a number of interesting machines such as the uh, the, the bombard, the uh, um, Zygowski sheets, of which some do exist, the cyclometer. And the answer is, where are they today? When the Poles were escaping from Poland, as the Germans were invading, they, were, they uh, went east, primarily east, so that on the 6th of September in the evening, they uh, or, or in the night, they left the, the, their workplace, which by then was Piri to the south of Warsaw. And they went on this general easterly, southeasterly track until they got to this place here called Wusk. They then went west just a little way to Ushiwug. And in Ushiwug, as explained in Dermot Turing's book, uh, The Real Story of How Enigma Was Broken, Radziva Historia Zuamania Chiffru Enigma, également disponible en la langue française. This is a modern map. Uh, you can see that Wusk, as it was, is now Lutsk, and it's also written in Cyrillic. And Ustiwuk is no longer Ustiwuk, and it's also written in Cyrillic, as is the intermediate stop, Vladimir Volinsky. And that's because this is all now Ukraine. But unfortunately, they buried all the hardware they had with them. They didn't have enough fuel for their trucks they were escaping in. They, were, they knew they were going to have to do some walking. So in fact, they destroyed all their hardware. And I do know of people who are hoping to hop over the border from Poland into uh, Ukraine and take a look and see if they can find some of this stuff. Of course, it may well by now be underneath a housing estate. Who knows? If you want to read more about this sort of thing, Marian Ryevsky has produced this book, Vspomnienia z my pracy for Biuro Shifruv, which this book is a magic book because if you turn it over and turn it upside down, then you have an English version and you can find this on, uh, on Amazon. Uh, this is a picture of the three gentlemen in question, Marian Ryevsky on the right, Jerzy Ryszycki in the center, Henryk Zygalski to the left. Dziękuję za uwagę. Chima Pytanie. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Please unmute yourself and ask. Ooh, your hometown, which is your hometown, Mr. Martin? So I don't have a question, Jerry. I just wanted to say thank you for this super interesting lecture. I mean, uh, I've been waiting many years. I've only recently learned about from a new friend from work that this is happening. So I really, really enjoyed it. Poznan is my hometown. Oh, Poznan. And you were showing, and you were showing a picture from where I used to live, literally 200 meters from Zamek, 
for 18 years as, as a oh. child, as a kid. And uh -huh. that street, that street is named Saint Martin, which is where my, yes. my, my where my name is coming from. Yes. So, so that was amazing, and I haven't seen the statue. It's it's something new over the last mm. few years. So that that would be one of the first things I'm going to go and see after this crazy COVID is finished, and I and I get back to see the yes. family. So, so just a massive thanks, and I also want to say thank you for speaking about those scientists and those guys with, with such respect. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been well noted and excellent uh, attempts at the Polish accent. So, well oh, done. thank you very much. Dziękuję bardzo. Well, if there's nothing further, I will close this call. I'd like to thank you for coming along. Uh, there will be further talks. Um, we've got roughly one talk a week uh, coming up in July, and there's quite a bit left this month. So, please take a look at TNMOC, the National Museum of Computing, .org. Have a look at the events and see if you'd like to book up for any more talks. And with that, I'll say thank you very much and do widzenia.